Auction is something we haven't done in a number of years, uh, but it will be uh, on Masters Weekend. That's why we've got the golf carts up there. Lots of different things that you can, you can uh, bid on. Of course, we've got our, our Scotland tour that's kind of part of that. We've got vacation homes and dinners and autographed memorabilia and tickets and uh, burp cloths. I mean, who doesn't need one of those? Uh, that are handmade and just all sorts of things if you are really trying to to figure out what you want to get for a certain pastor who's retiring maybe you could pick up something there that he'd like I think he really would like to go to Scotland so if you'd like to buy him a couple tickets for that anyway that's happening on April 13th Uh, the deadline for donations is today so that we can begin to get our catalog together and let you know uh, what we've got so you can start thinking about that uh, coming up here very very soon And then immediately following this service today, there's going to be just a very brief, like five-minute little informational uh, moment uh, for our transition team to come forward and just fill you in a little bit on what the transition process is going to look like here kind of leading up to and certainly beyond uh, that that June date when when Ernie does uh, just throw in the towel. Um, So that that will happen again immediately following the worship service. So please do stick around for that. Now let's continue to prepare our hearts for worship. Today, uh, rather toward toward the end of Jesus' ministry, uh, some Greeks come and and they tell two of the disciples, Andrew and Philip, that they'd like to see Jesus. Jesus, though, says that the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, but this will be a strange glory. Glory. Jesus says, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all people to myself. He's referring to his crucifixion when he'll be lifted up on a cross, but also to his resurrection when he'll be lifted up from death to new life. Jesus drew all kinds of people to his ministry, drawing no boundaries about who was invited into God's love. And now in his death and resurrection, Jesus says he will draw all people to him. Jesus invites each one of us into the strange glory of God's new creation. My friends, as the Spirit leads you, as you're able, as you desire, let's stand together and sing. be seated. Join me as we pray together. Welcoming God, you lift us up and offer each one of us a life-changing love that leaves no one out. Sometimes our hearts feel so heavy that we struggle to rise up and claim this new life. In this moment of quiet, we lift up to you those things we'd like to give up for good, for the sake of the good. Amen. In Psalm 51, we find words that we can use as our own prayer. 
The psalmist says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Don't take me from your whole, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. My friends, God hears our prayer for mercy and God answers us. God comes in love and lifts us to new life. So hear and believe this good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And now as people who have been forgiven and set free, we offer the peace of Christ to others with the words, the peace of Christ be with you and the response and also with you. Let us stand and greet one another offering to each other the peace of Christ.
I invite the children to join me on the chancel steps. everybody this morning good is anybody in a candy stupor from the spring thing yesterday I am I ate too much candy anyway this morning um, we're gonna talk about lifting things up lifting people up if I were to ask you the question what does it mean to lift someone up what would you say what does that mean what about if someone is lonely on the playground? How could you lift them up? Go hang out with them. It's, it's, it's sometimes we have to look for ways to lift people up. But today, I want to tell you a story um, that I was reminded of about my dad. When my dad was living, he used to work with people who had lost their jobs because he had lost his job and knew what it felt like. And so he started this group with a couple of his friends. And when people came to his group, he would give them a pen. And the pen was green. I should have worn it so nobody would pinch me today. And it said egg bar. Anybody have any idea what egg bar means? This is the way my dad would say it. Everything's going to be all right. <laughs> so that's what he would give people to lift them up. And um, I just, I love that because it still lifts me up when I think about him and the way he lifted people up. Um, I want to remind you too, do you remember in our story that the dog's name is Doug? What did he say when the talking dog named Doug? Does anybody remember when he first met Russell, what he said? Hi, my name is Doug. I have just met you and I love you. That's pretty uplifting, right? That's kind of dog language. If anybody has a dog, you know what I mean. When you come home, their tails are wagging, and they meet you at the door, and they just lift you up. Today, um, last week when we left our story, and this is the last week for anybody who's wondering, um, it, is, um, it was kind of dark. Um, Carl's house was on fire, and he had given up Kevin the mother bird because that's what months wanted. And so we left, and I was like, boy, that just is not very uplifting at all. But this is what happens today. The picture should be on the screen. Carl made it to Paradise Falls, but he felt lonely in his empty house. So with Russell and Doug's help, Carl went back and rescued Kevin. Yay! Now that's uplifting. But this time, Carl couldn't save his house. It fell down, down, down. That's not so happy, but that was okay. Because Carl might have lost his house, but he still had his memories of Ellie. And he also had his friends. So it ended up being a pretty happy story after all, right? Because he had made all these new friends that he hadn't anticipated making. And our church likes to help people too. So I would like to challenge you this week to lift someone up. And if I were to ask you to do that, what are some things you might be able to do to help lift someone up today? Or this week? <laughs> Was that directed at Mary Ellen? Um, yes, holding a baby brings lots of joy, too. Yes, and a big smile. Um, well, I know that there are things on your hearts that you know that you can do to, to lift other people's up, and I would like to challenge you to think of what those are and to try and do those this week. Will you pray with me? Repeat after me. Dear God, give us the heart to lift up family, friends, and enemies. We love you and want to share your love with others. Amen.
Let's look to God in prayer. God, we are grateful for your gift of peace, for your gift of love, for your gift of joy. As we turn now to words of scripture and the words of the sermon, we pray that you would open our ears that we might hear, that you would open our eyes that we might see, that you would open our hearts that we might believe and obey. And we pray these things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Scripture lesson this morning comes from John's Gospel, the 12th chapter, uh, verses 20 through 36. This is the beginning of the end. Jesus has entered into Jerusalem. It's the last week of Jesus' life, and he is preparing the disciples, trying to help the disciples understand what is going to take place in this coming week. So I invite you to listen to these words of Scripture and listen for God's word to us this day. There were some Greeks in town who'd come up to worship at the Passover feast. They approached Philip, who was from Bethsaida and said, in Galilee, and said, Sir, we'd like to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and together told Jesus. Jesus answered, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Jesus said, Listen carefully, unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, dead to the world, it's never more than a single grain of wheat. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. In the same way, anyone who holds on to life, just as it is, destroys that life. But if you let it go, reckless in your love, you'll have it forever, real and eternal. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Right now, I am shaken. And what am I going to say? Father, get me out of this. No, this is why I came in the first place. I'll say, Father, glorify your name. A voice came out of the sky and said, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The listening crowd said it was thunder. Others said an angel spoke to him. Jesus said, the voice didn't come from me, but for you. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the ruler of the world will be driven out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He put it this way to show how he was going to be put to death. Voices from the crowd answered, We heard from God's law that the Messiah lasts forever. How can it be necessary, as you put it, that the Son of Man must be lifted up? And who is this Son of Man? Jesus said, You're going to have the light just a little bit longer. Walk while you have the light before the darkness overtakes you. If you walk in the darkness, you don't know where you're going. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become children of light. May God bless this reading. May God bless our meditation on this, his word. Jesus says, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. That's a radical statement. When I'm lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. It's especially surprising when you think that Jesus is not talking about being lifted up on a throne. He's talking about being lifted up on a cross. I think it's a radical statement, but I also think it's good news. In a world that seems like it's falling apart, in a world where there's not much to hold us together. Jesus says, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. And so I'd like to think this morning about what Jesus means by that and what it means for us to follow a, a crucified and a risen Lord who draws all people to him. The story starts in Jerusalem at the Passover feast and some Greeks are in town, which seems a little strange. The Greeks are there to worship alongside the Jews at Passover. And just before this, uh, just before this happens, Jesus himself has entered into Jerusalem. That's what we'll celebrate next Sunday at Palm Sunday, that the crowds gather around Jesus. They, they welcome him as a hero. 
They begin to wave their palm branches. They say, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of the Jews. But there's some Pharisees watching, and the Pharisees see this, the religious leaders, and they just shake their heads, and they say, see, there's nothing we can do. The whole world has come after him. And almost as if to confirm this fear, these Greeks show up. And they say, we want to see Jesus. Uh, I think this theme that, that runs throughout John's gospel is important. Are we really seeing things the way they are? Are we seeing things clearly? It's important to Jesus. And it's important to us that, that we see clearly what is happening. Robert Barron says that Christianity is above all a way of seeing the world. Everything else in the Christian life, he says, flows around and circles from this transformation of vision. Uh, he says that, that Christians see the world differently, and that's why their prayer, why their action, why their way of being in the world is different from the world's. I think the primary difference between that, and this is what Barron says, is, is that, that either we see the world through the mind of fear, or we see the world through a mind of trust. And that makes a difference. Amen. He says that, that if we see the world through this, this lens of fear, then we think the world around us is hostile. We have to always be protecting ourselves. And there's this tendency to treat others as the enemy and, and, and to lash out at others. Rather than treating the world with this sense of trust that, that God is in charge. That God is at work. And so I think that's what's happening to these religious leaders, to the Pharisees. They are seeing the world through this lens of fear. And so they can't see Jesus for who he is. They see him as a threat. They'll lose their position of respect as teachers of the law. And so they treat Jesus as an enemy, and they, and they try to get rid of him, even if that means putting him to death. I think it's the same thing that happens to, to, the, to the Roman governor, to Pontius Pilate. Pilate is afraid. He's afraid that the people will rise up against him, that Jesus will inspire that. He's afraid the Roman emperor will think that he's weak and remove him. And so he's willing to send even an innocent man to the cross. That's what this fear can do. And sometimes I think it happens to us. Or at least sometimes it happens to me. We begin to live with this kind of fear and it clouds our vision. It brings out the, re the worst in us. I think that's why we gather each week for worship. Because we, we come saying we want to see Jesus. We want to understand who he is and what he's doing in the world and what he's doing in our lives. We want to have any spiritual blind spots, any kind of spiritual blindness healed. So we can see more clearly how Jesus is at work. The Greeks come and they say we want to see Jesus. And Jesus' response is... The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. It seems like a strange response, but I think what Jesus recognizes is you can't really see who he is. You can't understand what Jesus is doing unless you understand this strange glory of the cross. And so Jesus starts to talk about his, his death and his resurrection. Jesus says that unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and is buried it just remains as it is a single grain of wheat but if it falls in the ground and is buried it's transformed and, and, and it produces great fruit uh, we've got some flower bulbs I don't know what they are I just know they're flowers <laughs> they're buried in our yard throughout the winter time as if they're dead and now this time of year they're just blooming forth and Jesus says, you may not believe it, but this is what my death is going to be like. It's only if I let go. It's only if I go through this, this kind of death that I begin to produce much fruit. 
But he has to be willing to let go of his life. He has to be willing to trust wherever God is leading him. Now, the translation that, that we used says, Jesus says, anyone who holds on to life just as it is destroys that life. But if you let go of it, reckless in your love, you'll have it forever real and eternal. And so that's part of what Jesus is teaching us on the cross, is, is that there is this kind of, of death that we go through, this kind of letting go. And it's only through that that we can be lifted up and receive this new life. But I think there's also something larger going on, that, that the cross is not just about how, how we can be transformed by this different understanding of life in the world. It's also this larger sense of how God is at work even in the midst of our brokenness to redeem us and to heal us and to reconcile us to God and to each other. Uh, I shared a, a quote this week in the E! News that, that was from Christopher Watkin who said, the cross is a really strange symbol to choose as the central image of your religion if you're trying to start that religion in the first century. In the first century, when Jesus was here, the cross was not a symbol of love and forgiveness. It was this symbol of Roman brutality. Uh, Watkins says that, that uh, the Romans used the cross not just as a convenient way to execute people. It was meant to be this public spectacle. It was meant to be a symbol of what Rome could do. It was meant to send a message to people, this is what will happen to you if you cross Rome. And it's not just Rome. In some ways, the cross is built on this system of beliefs and assumptions, this, what, what Watkin calls a, a system of vengeance that says, if you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you even worse. It's based on this sense of, of we're in control and we can do whatever we want. And this kind of system becomes almost the default for human history. This system of vengeance and violence and fear where we're attacking each other as enemies. And it just leads to these cycles. So, so often people are oppressed and that creates fear both from them and for others. The oppressed rise up against those who oppress them and they become the new oppressors. Nietzsche once said, be careful, beware when you're fighting a monster so that you don't become a monster yourself. And you see that happening in history over and over again. We create monsters. And sometimes we become monsters. Even if we always blame it on someone else. We get trapped in these cycles and the violence and the fear just escalates. But what Jesus does on the cross is to step out of that operating system. Jesus refuses to participate, and he shows there's a different way of being, a different way of living in the world. Jesus refuses to retaliate. He refuses to return evil for evil. He refuses to, to allow himself to be converted into a mirror of his enemies. Instead, Jesus continues to love. Jesus continues to forgive, even if it leads him to the cross. And it looks like weakness. It looks like defeat, that Jesus is just letting the evil win. But instead, the cross is this strange new kind of strength. It shows that love has a power that hate and evil cannot match. And then there's a surprise ending. That after Jesus is crucified, dead, and buried, he rises again on the third day. There is this other power at work in the world. That power of love that can bring life even out of death. There is this light that shines in the darkness. And the darkness cannot overcome it. And so Jesus says, when I am lifted up, you'll see all this. When I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. And what the cross does is, is to help us see the world differently. To see that God is there even in the midst of the suffering. 
even in the midst of the brokenness, bringing healing and reconciliation and redemption. And the cross sheds light on that. It helps us understand. So the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, says, God has made known to us the mystery of his will that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So that's what God is doing, and that's what the church is a part of, at least when we're at our best. The church becomes this place where folks all come together, drawn by Christ. Becomes a place where there is neither Jew or Gentile, where there's neither slave or free, where there's no longer male and female, but all are one in Christ. We don't always get that right. But that's what God is doing. And that's where Jesus is leading us. Our church's vision statement is to participate in God's work through Jesus Christ of redeeming, reconciling, and healing all things. And we do that by celebrating God's grace wherever we see it. We do that by following Jesus wherever he leads us. We do that by healing God's world wherever we get opportunities. The crowd in our story is confused by all of this. And we might be a little bit too. But Jesus simply says, you have the light with you. So walk by the light. Believe in the light. And you'll be children of light. And I think that's still Jesus' answer. Jesus says, I'm here. I'm the light of the world. I'm the way you can see the world clearly. So trust that light. Believe that light. Walk in that light. And you'll find life. Real life. Eternal life. Amen. Let's look to God in prayer. God, we know that sometimes there is too much darkness in this world. Sometimes it seems like the darkness is overtaking us. So God, help us to see your light. Help us to see your love. Help us to walk in the light and become children of light for the sake of the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Part of our response to the word, part of our response to the call of Christ on our lives, part of our response to God's goodness is to do things to lift up others, to lift up this world. And how do we do that? Well, many, many ways, but one of the ways that, that we practice here in our time together, one of the ways that we practice as a community of faith is to give back out of that with which we've been blessed so that our gifts, so that our time and our talents can serve to lift others up. And so we take this opportunity as a response to God's goodness, as the Spirit leads us to return our thanks, to return our gifts, so that they may lift and light the lives of those in this world.
I just want to say, choir, you're really crushing it this month. <laughs> Doing really, really well. So thank you for your gifts. Uh, as we head into a time of prayer, I just want to bring a few things to your attention, some celebrations and some concerns, and, and would invite you to be thinking of others that you would like to share with us so that we can share them together. Uh, we certainly uh, want to lift up the Betton family. Uh, if you had not heard, uh, Rick Betton, who is a longtime member of our congregation, a fixture in our choir and in many other places in our church and in our community, passed away last Sunday suddenly uh, in the midst of a triathlon. Uh, Rick was uh, an athlete and uh, just a character. Um, and that's just putting it mildly. Many, many other words could be used to describe Rick and uh, the impact of his passing uh, will be felt uh, long and deeply in this congregation and community. And so we lift up Jenny and their family as they mourn and as they grieve and adjust and wrap their heads around this. Uh, and we prepare for the celebration of his life on April 6th at two o'clock in this space. Lord, in your mercy. In a completely other arena and a different vein, uh, we celebrate. Yesterday, we had many, many young people and many families uh, out in our talent field uh, enjoying the beautiful day and uh, looking for Easter eggs, which were not hidden very well, but that, uh, that's beside the point, uh, and, and playing games and, and, and just building community and building relationships. And we just really, uh, it was just beautiful to see some people, I won't mention any names, forgot to put on sunscreen. <clears throat> uh, but you know uh, it was a beautiful day and so we, we rejoice uh, that we have opportunities to do things like that as well Lord in your mercy and I think it's appropriate to, uh, to mention since he's present this morning we continue to rejoice uh, on the birth of Ahalia the granddaughter of uh, Cindy and Bert or Bertie uh, Higgins That's grand are we going with that Bertie grand Grandpa Bertie Okay, um, so we, we rejoice with, with, uh, with you all and your family, Lord, in your mercy. Other ways that we can join with you. We did uh, learn uh, this week also the passing. Wilson Davis uh, lost his, his sister. She was 91 uh, and, and passed away after a period of decline. And so we surround uh, Wilson with our prayers, Lord, in your mercy. Other things. Let's go to God. Great big God, you are mighty and mysterious and great enough to gather all your creation to you. Great enough to lift us up out of our despair and our darkness great enough to open our eyes and our ears great enough to love us all great enough to give us life great enough to extend grace and mercy when we struggle and we just don't understand the world or your ways Lord God as we sit in quietness our thoughts are far from quiet we're wrestling with doubts and fears we're looking for answers we're hoping against hope we're seeking strength we're hungry for warm sunshine, for healed bodies, for rest from tears. And your word says the hungry will be filled. We ask today for you to fill us. Fill us up with the breath of life. Fill us up with thankful hearts. Fill us with calmness, courage, and most of all with the knowledge of your presence. Lord, there are people we know and love who are sick and suffering, and we ask, God, that you would surround them with your strong healing presence. Grant wisdom to those who need answers to difficult questions. Grant hope to those who are living with hurt and friendship to those who feel lonely. Most of all, Lord God, may we know your love, your great love that you have for each one of us. You know the hairs on our head. You count each beat of our heart. You knit us together when we were being formed. You know our getting up and our lying down. You are familiar with all our ways. There's no place we can hide from you. You were there at our beginning, and you will be with us through to the end. 
So may we not lose sight of your constant care. We look to you, O oh God, to be present in our communities and in our world. We ask that you continue to show us how Westminster can be a part of your work in the world. Teach us how we can grow into faith and become more and more like Jesus. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would bless the work of our hands and the words from our mouths. Bless all that we offer and receive today. We gather all our prayers together, the spoken and the unspoken, and pray the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. <laughs> Mind you, we do have that brief five minute or so informational meeting after the, the worship service if you're able to stay for that. And now go out in the world in peace. Have courage. Hold fast that which is good. Return to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint hearted. Support the weak. Help those who are suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of God's Holy Spirit. And now, by the grace of God our Father, the love of his son, Jesus Christ, and the power of God's spirit be with you now and always.
invite you, if you're able to stay for the information meeting, to uh, have a seat. Uh, I'd like to thank Janet Hurd, who is chairing our transition team, uh, for being here and for giving you a few words. And we, we will have some information sheets, frequently asked questions. If you're interested, there are a few of those at the back. Good morning. Let's take a quick moment of prayer. Lord, I invite you into this space with us. We are grateful for Ernie and his leadership. We ask for your support in his transition and the transition that our church will be going through for our future leader. We ask for your discernment and patience and be with us as a congregation as we go through our transitions. Amen. So first, let me um, once again remind everyone who is on the transition team. And if you're here, wave or stand up. So again, Janet Hurd, I'm the chair. Derek Gracie, Stephanie Keeney, Larry Hooker, Melanie Woodard, Gary Cram, and Bert Andia are also on the committee. And so we're very grateful for everyone for saying yes. So the way the process works, and I'm gonna go over high level just so everyone has a general understanding. First, <clears throat> Ernie of course informed the congregation that he intended to retire um, February 10th. Then we moved into the process of having our transition team formed and approved by session. Now we are in the phase of finalizing the job description for the transitional pastor. We're receiving some passive interest. We may go and also do some formal solicitations for interest. And once we have that slate of candidates, we'll go through the process to interview and then take a recommendation to the session. So the interim or transitional, we use those words back and forth, um, pastor will ultimately be hired by the session um, they will be on a 12-month contract that is renewable um, and we aim ideally to have this person identified in the July time frame. Some of that will depend on how we go through the process, the individual schedule for us to come up with a, a final start date. Second, the transition team also supports the creation and finalization of the mission study the interim will also support us in that process. Once we, well, part of the mission study also will include con congregational input. So you play a critical role. We will have listening sessions. We definitely want high participation. We'll finalize the mission study. That goes to the presbytery to be approved. Once they approve it, we are able to move forward with electing a pastor nominating committee. So the pastor nominating committee is then the group who will go through the process to find our next permanent senior pastor. Um, in general, that's a nine to 12 month period. It just will take as long as it takes um, for us to get the right person. Once that person's identified, the presbytery will approve the call. Us as the congregation will vote, and then the new pastor will be installed. As Ernie said, we've created some uh, frequently asked questions. This is a very noticeable shade of, I don't know, green, yellow. So some of these are back in the narthex. We'll also have them available in the fellowship hall for as long as people are picking them up. We will also have these slides. We, I don't know if we have handouts of the slides right now, but we're gonna put them in the fellowship hall as well as have some handouts. So, and there will be a place on our website soon where you can get all of this reference material. We'll be providing regular updates to keep everybody informed on the process. I'll hang out if anyone has any specific questions right now. You can always reach out to me, Larry Hooker, or anyone else on our committee. So thank you. <laughs>